thank you very much, John. Uh, you have done yeoman's work in pulling together this annual conference. Uh, it really does offer us a unique perspective to think outside the box, uh, particularly from the postal world. There's so many uh, good friends and colleagues and familiar faces in this room, um, but also a lot of unique perspective that normally you might not see in a normal U.S. postal and delivery conference. And that's important because as we've all talked about this morning, we'll talk about later this afternoon and tomorrow as well, uh, the world is changing and uh, particularly in the postal delivery world, changing quite drastically. And we've heard this morning, and we'll continue to focus throughout today and tomorrow on the disruptive nature of that B2Me movement. The B2Me movement has changed and challenged the use of data, responses from retail, e-commerce, and delivery, and driven innovations in the supply chain. Our immediate previous panel, before we came in here for lunch, highlighted responses from national postal operators to meet this new consumer empowerment model. And so before we move after lunch to hear from the private sector perspectives, I want to take the opportunity as the U.S. regulator of our nation's postal administration to linger just a little bit longer on the governmental perspective and focus on the challenge for our U.S. Postal Service to fully adapt to the future. My B to me, my focus today, will be to plead that policymakers and we as a nation address a basic consideration. What are the specific universal service obligations of the Postal Service? In other words, what do each of us as American citizens need from the Postal Service as a government service, and what is its cost? For we can discuss all the changes needed to transform the entire sector to focus on the B2Me movement, but without clarity on its mission, America's Postal Service will be set up for frustration and risk of failure. Here in the U.S., as Preston outlined on the last panel, our nation's postal operator has positioned itself to adapting to this changing marketplace. However, the Postal Service is trying to move forward into strong headwinds. The financials of the U.S. Postal Service are a mess. In 2015, the Postal Service had a total net loss of $5.1 billion, which is an improvement from 2014. However, this is the ninth consecutive net loss since 2007 and has increased the cumulative net deficit since then to $56.8 billion. These continuing losses have negatively impacted liquidity requiring the Postal Service to use all of its $15 billion statutory borrowing capacity and causing total liabilities to far exceed total assets by almost $50 billion. In the past five years, the Postal Service has not made any of the pre required prefunding payments into its future retiree health benefit fund. This accruing non-payment into the fund has skewed the Postal Service's current liabilities in relation to its assets. To reduce its debt ratio to historic averages, the Postal Service would have to significantly increase its current cash position or investments in capital assets and reduce its obligations to the Retiree Health Benefit Fund. Low liquidity levels in recent years have impeded the Postal Service's ability to make capital investments in infrastructure. It now operates an aging vehicle fleet increasing the need and consequently the cost for maintenance and repair. Also unmet is the need to invest in sorting and handling equipment to fully capitalize on business opportunities in the growing package delivery markets. Total mail volume in 2015 dropped to levels not seen in more than 27 years, and the Postal Service anticipates further reductions in total volumes in 2016. The continuous decline in first-class mail seriously jeopardizes the Postal Service's ability to cover its fixed overhead costs. Recent increases in revenues and subsequent higher liquidity are largely due to the temporary market-dominant product exigent surcharge. The additional revenue from competitive products, which are mainly parcels, is not sufficient to offset the future revenue loss resulting from the termination of the exigent surcharge when it is removed in just a few weeks. At that point, in order to maintain the operating net income it is currently achieving, 
the Postal Service would have to make up the loss of that revenue, which is approximately $2.1 billion annually, with the growing liability of retiree health benefits, the inability to borrow for needed capital investments, and the continued loss of high-margin first-class mail revenue, the important task of improving the financial condition of the Postal Service is daunting. Now, in the U.S., it's important to keep in mind that the Postal Service is 100 percent part of the federal government. Today, the Postal Service is a $69 billion operation with more than 600,000 employees. It is not quasi-government, quasi-private, or quasi-anything. It is 100 percent part of the federal government operating as an independent establishment in the executive branch. Yet the Postal Service receives no tax dollars for operating expenses and relies completely on the sale of postage, products, and services to fund its operations. As a separate and independent federal regulator, the Postal Regulatory Commission determines the legality of the Postal Service's prices and products, adjudicates complaints and fair competition issues, and oversees the Postal Service's delivery performance consistent with statutory requirements. The Commission is the regulator, not the operator of our nation's Postal Service. As John indicated, it's composed of five commissioners, each appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. The Commission receives an annual appropriation from Congress out of the Postal Service Fund. Why a regulator for another government agency? Unlike almost any other federal agency, the Postal Service operates in a commercial marketplace while also having a large contingent of captive customers, given the Postal Service's market dominance for certain products and services. The public interest role of a regulator in this case is clear, a need to protect the captive customers and ensure fair competition. The Postal Service is the one government agency that touches every American on a daily basis. It is an organization that literally serves more than 150 million American households and businesses on a typical day. It facilitates trillions of dollars in commerce. The fundamental problem is that the Postal Service cannot currently generate sufficient funds to cover its mandated expenses and also invest in critically deferred capital needs. Where can we look for answers? I would argue the starting point is to look at ourselves. What do we as a nation need from a postal and delivery system and what is its cost? What exactly is universal mail service in the United States? The Commission has determined that unlike other countries, the Universal Service Obligation, or USO, in the United States is largely undefined and instead is comprised of a broad set of policy statements with only a few legislative prescriptions. The Commission estimates the cost of providing universal service to be more than $4 billion annually. When assessing the current state of the Postal Service, policymakers should look at this fundamental issue and decide exactly what we as a nation need from the Postal Service, and most importantly, how those expectations are to be funded. So when we discuss how the postal ecosystem is adapting to the B2Me movement, we have a problem ensuring our Postal Service can adapt to the future, what with all of its financial headwinds. In the absence of a clear definition of its governmental mission of universal service, particularly given the Postal Service's current financial challenges, each of us may have differing view of what the Postal Service must provide in its services and operations to fulfill the USO. And since there is no specific agreed upon definition, all of our views will have different price tags. The PRC has defined the universal service obligation as having seven attributes geographic, range of products, access to facilities, delivery frequency, prices, affordability, quality of service, and users' rights or enforcement. Other nations have imposed universal service requirements directly on its postal operator by statute, regulation, licensing, or contract. Countries like Australia, Canada, and Germany, just to name a few, have a detailed definition of universal postal service with specific standards for delivery and retail access. However, as I noted, unlike other countries, the universal service obligation in the United States is largely undefined and is instead comprised of that broad set of policy statements with only a few legislative prescriptions, 
Aside from the mandate since 1982 to provide six days of delivery, Congress has rarely established rigid numerical standards of minimally acceptable service for each of these features. Rather, through its history, the Postal Service has been expected to use its flexibility to meet the needs and expectations of the nation while balancing the delivery of service against budgetary constraints. In the same way that Congress created, as John outlined, a postal regulator in 1970 and got out of the business of setting rates, and then expanded its authority and powers in 2006 to also oversee service and competition, Congress created a board of directors in 1970, a board of governors, to direct, quote, the exercise of the power of the Postal Service and to, quote, represent the public interest generally. Despite the existence of this 11-person board, or lack thereof, several nominees to be a governor remain pending before the Senate for yet another year. In fact, there's only one governor remaining on the board when there are supposed to be nine governors, the other members of the board being the Postmaster General and her deputy. As this governing board tries to navigate these rapidly changing waters, such as the B2B movement, they cannot lose sight of the USO. But what is it? The problem is that the Postal Service can't be sure. But today, in 2016, as I outlined, the Postal Service financials are a mess. In that environment, aside from the financial pressure of generating sufficient funds to remain solvent, a key worry is somehow funding the $4 billion universal service obligations, let alone monies to keep the mail moving, undertake capital investments, and pay other multi-billion dollar obligations such as retiree costs. Some have called for the Postal Service to enter the world of banking. Others have decried their closing or consolidation of facilities. Indeed, legislation in Congress would direct them to offer certain services, such as censors, tell them what vehicles to procure and how to do it, institute bans on closing any post offices or facilities from anywhere from two to five years, mandate specific standards. The list goes on and on and on. Now, let me be clear. I am agnostic on what Congress mandates. If 218 members in the House, 60 in the Senate, and the President sign legislation, then that, under the Constitution, is the prerogative and authority of the Congress. What I am deeply concerned by, however, is that there's absolutely no cost-benefit analysis that goes on when Congress steps back into the role of the Board of Directors, despite having created one in 1970, and puts limits and restrictions and mandates on their operations. Surely there is a limit to what the Postal Service can afford and still remain self-sustaining. If instead, like other nations, we have a thoughtful back to basics, what do we require the Postal Service to do as a government entity to serve this nation? That is, what is the USO and what is its cost? We can better ensure that it can remain self-sustaining. We can also better analyze when a Congress thinks about breaking that definition open and adding or subtracting requirements that a thoughtful analysis is undertaken as to the effect on its bottom line and ability to remain self-financing. Thus, it seems that policymakers really need to start at the beginning and decide what exactly we as a nation need and how it can be funded. But that requires the ability to engage in a thoughtful and comprehensive examination. The legislative process very seldom offers the opportunity to take such in-depth assessments, particularly with so many competing interests at stake mailers, employees, competitors, consumers. Very often, there is little unanimity among all or within each category of these groups. And in the current political environment, unless members of Congress and senators are consistently hearing about the issue when they are back in their districts and states, it is difficult, absent a complete postal meltdown, whether Congress will act, particularly in a comprehensive manner. But the Postal Service, with its balance sheet and future projections, need clarity and certainty. I would suggest it is time. In fact, it is overdue. Is it pie in the sky to think that this back to basics can occur? No, not any more than the more limited fixes that have yet to see passage despite yeoman's efforts in congressional committees for the past half dozen years. Maybe a focus on the fundamentals would be more fruitful. Congress wouldn't have to start at scratch. The Postal Regulatory Commission, less than eight years ago, 
laid the foundation in a comprehensive report on the USO. Congress can pick it up and hit the ground running on better defining the USO. While fixing the balance sheet is critical, my call today is to not ignore the fundamentals. The vast changes we are talking about at this conference today and tomorrow can only be weathered by the U.S. Postal Service if they have clarity of mission. Despite challenges to doing so, I remain hopeful that our leaders will, at the end of the day, have the proverbial willingness to make tough decisions, the wisdom to see the world as it is rather than as we would like it to be, and the courage to compromise on behalf of the greater good. Our nation's postal system and the more than 320 million Americans who depend on it uh, expect no less. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions whatsoever. Yeah, Hamilton. Uh, we've heard today about the importance of innovation for folks, and, and perhaps that's a path away or out of some of the quandaries that you uh, presented uh, in the previous presentation. What specific challenges does the regulator have in, in an environment of accelerating innovation? How do you respond to that? Oh, thank you, Hamilton. Uh, to the extent, if people hadn't heard the question, just to restate, uh, given the challenges and the rapid change and need to innovate within the postal and delivery sector, how does that impact, if you will, the Postal Regulatory Commission and the regulatory environment? Uh, in some ways, the Postal Regulatory Commission has a very defined role within the statute. We have final authority over the rates they set, the products they offer, uh, adjudicate fair competition issues. Uh, we uh, look at their service uh, standards. We adjudicate uh, appeals of post office closings. Uh, I would argue to the extent that the rapidly changing environment affects the Postal Service, the cases before us uh, and the nature of those reflect that. But we as the regulator are not the operator. And so to the extent that the world is a changing and it creates these public policy challenges, uh, those are really borne by the Postal Service itself and where the regulator sees that are the cases before us. That being said, I do believe the expertise that we have at the Commission on the Postal Service, its rates, its operations, the work we've done on universal service and the monopoly, uh, we have an important voice that Congress does look to and we provide input to. and. Hence, my comments today is a, a call to arms, if you will, for our policymakers to uh, build upon that work and deal with fundamental issues that actually are outside our wheelhouse. David. You have several important studies coming up. Could you talk a little bit about what those are intended to be? Yeah. Oh, sure. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, the, the Postal Regulatory Commission in the coming year and a half, two years, has some very critical studies that uh, are mandated by law. Uh, the first one that's on our plate is by the end of this year, the law requires at least every five years, we look at the 2006 law, which fundamentally was the first time our nation changed its postal laws in a comprehensive way, and the last time it did so, uh, since 1970, when our postal service was created at, out of what was a cabinet agency. Every five years, we're supposed to assess the changes of that 2006 law and provide recommendations to the President and Congress how it's working and how it can be improved. Uh, we're starting that process now, and we'll issue that report. Uh, the second and probably even more critical one goes to the rate-setting system of our United States Postal Service. I talked about the financials earlier and referenced that uh, there's a temporary surcharge in place that provides about $2 billion a year to the Postal Service and its bottom line. It was put in place to recoup the losses they incurred in the Great Recession, and under that law, that will be rescinded on April 10th of this year, but that has a bottom line impact. That's all part of a rate-setting system that, for the most of uh, Postal Service's products, were put in place a price cap system in the 2006 law. But what the 2006 law also said was after 10 years, of this price cap system, the regulator needs to 
look at how that system is operated and see if it's meeting the objectives of the law. And if it isn't, uh, make such modifications or such alternative system to meet those objectives. Uh, as we know, the financials of the Postal Service are, uh, are not good. One of the nine objectives in law is the financial stability of the Postal Service, including a mandate that they have retained earnings. Uh, needless to say, they do not. Uh, so we have uh, the responsibility to undertake a, a full assessment. We're going to begin that as the law requires uh, after 10 years, which would be December 20th. Uh, my uh, desire and commitment to uh, the postal community in the United States is that we do that as efficiently and effectively as possible. The last place I want to be is to be creating uncertainty uh, for the mailing community. So. Uh, I expect later this year, uh, before the end of summer, we'll be outlining for uh, the, the public what our plan is, uh, and on December 20th, begin that study immediately, open it up for comment, focus on how those objectives are working, and hopefully over the course of 2017, be able to uh, end up with a uh, conclusion that provides uh, uh, more answers than questions. So. Uh, those are two critical studies that are on our plate. There's a few more. Uh, we also, every five years, have to look at the contribution to the Postal Service's overhead from competitive products, what that percentage should be, because the idea is the letter products, the market down products, uh, can't be cross-subsidizing uh, and subsidizing their competitive ventures. Uh, so we have to make sure that contribution is set appropriately. We'll be looking at that. And then in addition to all that, there's the uh, normal overflowing docket of cases before us. You know, the Postal Regulatory Commission, it's, uh, as I said, sometimes it's like David and Goliath. We are an agency of barely 70 people, and that includes the commissioners and their staff, regulating a $69 billion operation with 600,000 people. Now, again, we're the regulator, not the operator, and I'm not suggesting we should be anything in size and scope. But we do that with a budget that's pretty much been flatlined. Uh, last year was the first year we got an appropriation that was at a level never seen before. So uh, we're running hard. Uh, I worry about the staff at the commission. They do really uh, hard work, great work. Um, but uh, one of my tasks as uh, the current head of the agency is making sure not only are we working as efficiently and effectively in what we do, but that the staff have the resources they need and they feel good as public employees about the work they do each day. So uh, it's a little bit of a longer answer to your question, David, but thank you.